Despite the claims that 5th edition will only be growing rather than updating to a new edition, D&D is still getting a new set of core books later in 2024. In this video, we're going to talk about what that kind of means for the series, as well as really dissect the idea of this not being a 5.5. I know WotC says that it isn't, but WotC also says a lot of stuff that they end up going back on because it was silly to say in the first place. So let's discuss 1D&D &D and what it really is, or rather what it is as of the time of recording. Before we get too far into this, I want to reiterate again that at the time of recording, WotC has been very hesitant to confirm or deny much of anything about 1D&D. &D. The interviews and videos they've released have been frustratingly vague, and while we can glean quite a bit from the Unearthed Arcana playtests, we have no real confirmation on what will make it into the final products from those playtests. Everything we currently have is, at best, educated guesswork. When it comes to what these new books are, we don't have official names for them yet, but we know that WotC is working on functional replacements or upgrades for the Player's Handbook, the DM's Guide, and the Monster Manual. Functionally, these three books represent the core rules of Dungeons & Dragons, and in any other situation, we'd be considering this a new edition. They keep promising, however, that this will be a sort of updating or upgrading of 5th edition rather than a new edition, but the reality remains to be seen. And when I hear those terms, they kind of sound like the same. I mean, wouldn't a new edition theoretically be an update or an upgrade? But anyway, fundamentally, this means a complete overhaul to character creation, base mechanics, and monster designs. When it comes to when these books are coming out, even this is quite hazy. We have multiple announcements and advertisements that say all three of the new core books will be released in 2024, which is uncharacteristically vague. Previous releases have given us firm release dates months in advance, so this may be hinting at a very late 2024 release. We did get a leak, however. An official image and tweet that was very rapidly taken down advertises that the new core books will be releasing on May 21st, 2024, but that date has been scrubbed from the website entirely. We'll see if that date was taken down because of delays or if they were just jumping the gun on the announcement. A lot of people are curious if they are going to need these books in order to continue playing D&D and just want to bring up very quick that nothing is ever going to stop you from playing D&D 5th edition as it is right now. The books aren't going to disappear and all the content you already own still works just fine. Uh, this is a good moment to bring up the importance of physical media. Uh, you may need to buy these new core books for any new content released after it, though. Not quite obviously. Based on what we've seen so far, they're attempting to integrate this new content rather than replace the old stuff. But regardless of their claims, most of what we've seen consists of functional replacements. This means that for any adventure paths or supplements we'll see after these new core books come out, they will be used for them as a foundation. I, like others, are also curious about what's going on with the new virtual tabletop. WotC has been working on its own virtual tabletop version of D&D for a few years now. Virtual tabletops are typically system agnostic, but this one will be decidedly D&D exclusive. It'll also be the new D&D exclusive on release, so if you're planning on booting up the shiny new virtual tabletop, expect to need a few new books along with it. Based on what we've seen, this new virtual tabletop will likely be quite good, but it's also likely to carry a monthly subscription fee, which you have heard me complain about in the past if you are a frequenter of this channel. So just keep all of this in mind when you start considering what system to run after the changeover. So let's discuss what we could confidently assume is changing. You'll have to take all of this with a grain of salt once again since it's not actually released yet, but we can still run down all the things that have been strongly hinted at and how they'll affect your games. Starting with background ability score, something they've openly talked about is switching your starting ASI, ability score increase, from a racial feature to a background feature. Functionally, many builds will stay as they are, but you'll get a lot less pressure to select specific races for classes that use their boosted ability score. It also makes a bit more sense that your early life and career makes that difference rather than just what you were born as, and helps cut down on biological determinism. Next up are the Ardlings. It seems that Azimar are no more and are being replaced by the Ardlings, animal-headed celestial creatures either born on the higher planes or with angelic ancestors. This is... Frankly, a weird choice, but I highly suspect that it has something to do with the fact that Watsi doesn't own the word Azimar and can't copyright it, but they'll own these 
angel animal things whole cloth. So cool trade, guys. This is like when Warhammer had to trademark their own version of elves or whatever. It's just, it's just so stupid. Another change is that ability score increases are feats now. And this is less of a change than you might think. But the fiddly trading your ability score increase for a feat has been made into simply gaining a feat with the ability score increase feat as the default option. Next up is something that I actually quite like and use a homebrew version of in my own campaigns. It's Bastions. Basically a base building mechanic. This will seem very familiar to players who remember strongholds and they seem to be picking up a lot of those old ideas. Bastions are structures that grant bonuses for resting in them and build up special points the players can spend to essentially gain resupplies and reinforcements. And then of course something I think most of us know about, classes are getting overhauled. Every class has been combed through and updated. Some are functionally about the same, while some have been completely reshaped into something new. There are far too many changes to go over in this video, but I can at least list some of the most drastic changes, such as the fact that Druids started the playtest very differently, but they seem to have settled on relatively minor changes to how Wild Shape works. Druids will now get to Wild Shape as a bonus action by default, but in exchange they'll only be able to select a few Wild Shape options rather than having the whole monster manual on their roster. I know that my Druid main wife is upset by this choice, but I'm very curious what all of you other Druid players out there think about this. Uh, another thing is that sorcerers are getting a bunch of substantial tweaks, and the one I'm most excited for here is the converting of your sorcery points into spells no longer takes a bonus action. We're also messing a bit with the sorcerer archetype progression, so it'll be strange to see how they consolidate that with older sorcerer archetypes. We also have something for the Warlocks, who are surprisingly similar to their current state, but practically all the invocations have gotten tuned and altered slightly. We're also getting some limited capacity to regain spell slots, thank god, and you'll find a lot of the language in Pact Magic has been cleaned up. And we should also probably talk about class groups. This is sort of an internal change that won't affect play that much, but all the character classes are getting placed into one of four category groups. Experts, Mages, Priests, and Warriors. This may seem familiar if you played back in the 4th edition days, but essentially some abilities and effects would only be usable or only apply to certain classes. A good current example of this are those magical items that are usable by spellcasters only. In 1 D&D, spellcasters will instead be the mage class group. For players, this will only really be a guideline for what general battlefield role they can expect each class to take and what powers they can expect to gain as the class advances. And then we have level 1 feats. Practically every background printed in 2023 had this already, and had to make caveats for if you're not playing this way. It is all but confirmed that once the new books roll around, every background will also provide a feat at first level. It looks like most backgrounds will provide a specific feat, but some will give a choice between a short list of feat options. And then on the opposite end, we have level 20 capstone feats. While most games don't reach level 20 anyway, they are trying to make reaching that high bar a bit more enticing, which... Good. In addition to having a unique capstone feature, 1D&D will introduce epic boons, extremely powerful feats that can only be taken at level 20 or potentially at post-20 gameplay. Functionally, this does make your capstone feature more flexible, but 20th level games are so rare to begin with that it isn't likely to make much of a difference at your own table. That being said, Watsi has hinted at trying to make extremely high tier play more workable, so we'll see if epic adventures and their epic boons stick the landing. Although I gotta tell you, as a DM, I am curious what they could really do to make these sessions more playable. Speaking of things that I think will only work through the use of magic, spell lists. Rather than having a unique spell list for each class, we're now dividing all spells into three spell lists, Arcane, Divine, and Primal. On one hand, this removes some of the uniqueness of each class, but on the other, it really does streamline things quite a bit, especially if you're trying to make a virtual tabletop out of your rule set. Arcane, Divine, and Primal do a good job of laying out the general behind-the-scenes divisions we already had anyway, and makes looking up spells much simpler. Moving from spells over to good old-fashioned melee, we have Weapon Mastery. Every weapon category is now getting a Weapon Mastery that can be unlocked through class features, mainly from the warrior classes. 
For example, the weapon mastery for Great Axes is called Cleave, which allows you to make an additional attack at an adjacent creature once you hit the first one with your mighty swing. This is a fun idea that gives weapons more utility and more powerful options when in the hands of characters that are specifically trained in them without just locking other characters out of using the weapons. And frankly, anything that adds this sort of specific utilization for melee characters that can kind of turn combat from something other than just hit with it, uh, I approve of any sort of additions to the game like this. This is good stuff. I know that my tone may come across as negative about all this stuff, but that really isn't the case. My tone is just me being incredulous towards a company and their corporate overlords, because uh, the last two years has, some would argue the last five or six or seven years, has kind of warranted that attitude. But honestly, a lot of this stuff that's coming to the table I really enjoy it. I do think that games like this deserve to evolve and take new shape as better ideas form. It's mainly just the position of it not being a new addition that I'm confused about. So I'm taking all of these, what some would consider drastic changes and trying to keep a straight face about it. Like, no, 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 it's just fifth edition, but they're changing almost everything that makes the old books not usable anymore. I, it's it's not something that I can just talk about uncomplicatedly, so I apologize if my tone is negative, but honestly, a lot of the stuff that is coming to D&D, &D, uh, or D &D, one D&D, &D, I should say, I'm looking forward to it. But why did you... The, you really, you're switching up the Azimars for that? Thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Be sure to like and subscribe because we're coming out with new content all the time. Go see what we're up to over on SkullSplitterDice.com. And if you have any thoughts on 1D&D, &D, I would really like to hear them down in the comments. Thanks again for watching. My name's Patrick Ferguson from SkullSplitterDice, and until next time, farewell.